Good evening and welcome back to Byline. We're here at Amherst Media, a public affairs show sponsored by the Amherst League of Women Voters and our local cable TV station. And we're helping you get to understand and get to know our new town councilors, our new legislators in Boston. And uh, tonight we have uh, two guests, the two district councilors from District 4. And we want to welcome Evan Ross and Thank Steve you. Schreiber. And, um, oh gosh, this goes very fast. You know, we've only got 27 minutes together. <laughs> so I'm going to try to keep this moving. Um, so, Evan, you're a millennial, and Steve, you're not. <laughs> I'm a <laughs> and baby Steve, boomer. Steve, <laughs> you're a boomer. And Steve, you're a department head at UMass, and uh, Evan, you're not. I am not. But then again, you're a millennial, so you're just getting started as a lecturer <laughs> at UMass. Environmental sciences is your specialty and architecture and regional planning and those sorts of things is your specialty. Architecture is in the regional planning department or is it separate Architecture is a separate department. Separate department. We're in the same building. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. So um, you each bring something different to the table and um, you know most of the community were focused on the at-large and the people in your district were focused on you guys, but the rest of the town doesn't necessarily know who you are. So give us a little bit of your background by focusing on what you bring to the table that uh, you hope will make a big difference as a member of the council. So why don't we start with you? Yeah, so I have lived in Amherst 13 years. I was recruited to, to work at UMass to, to lead what was then the architecture program in the Department of Art, and now is the Department of Architecture. So I pretty quickly got involved in Amherst politics by um, running for and being elected to town meeting and then also being appointed to the planning board. And so through both of those, I think I brought a lot of expertise, particularly in the planning slash design areas. So when the change of government came about, I was um, deeply committed to really helping this town in ways that, that I can. And I, I saw that among those 13, it would be great if someone had design planning background. So that was the primary reason that I decided to run. Great. And there are a lot of issues in town that feed into that from economic development to housing, et cetera, et cetera. We'll talk more about that as we go along. So Evan, uh, what do you bring to the table other uh, than your youthful exuberance? <laughs> I like this. Um, so. I came to, to Amherst about eight years ago now, originally for graduate school at UMass in the Department of Environmental Conservation. Um, but before that, I was living in Rhode Island, working for the state government, uh, the Department of Environmental Management. Uh, and while I was hired there, predominantly as a field tech role, uh, I fell into the role of community outreach and community engagement. Um, and in my time there, one of the things that I worked hard on uh, was sort of identifying stakeholders in the community and trying to build relationships and collaborations between stakeholders, citizen groups, uh, universities, nonprofits. Uh, and so when I looked at what I could bring to the council, uh, that was one of the things that I thought would be really valuable, was the ability to identify stakeholders, work with stakeholders, um, and try to figure out what are the competing visions and, and where is their compromise within those competing visions, uh, which has nothing to do with my environmental science background, mm -hmm. um, but is experiences I've had just in the environmental field. Mm -hmm. So that's a way of doing business, but what's the content that you want to focus on? Because I noted in your introductory comments at the uh, first uh, organizational meeting of the council, you spent your entire uh, time talking about climate change and I didn't surprise me as a young person because it's a big issue and your generation is going to be responsible for <laughs> helping us fix this. We certainly but are. I also noted that during your campaign you focused on other issues uh, as well and maybe uh, more heavily on some other issues. So what's the content? Right. So uh, in, in the currently I've been working with Councillor Dumont um, on this climate committee uh, charge and that is something that we are starting with and it makes sense given my background to work with her on that. Uh, but certainly one of the issues that got me into the campaign 
um, and has always been my focus has been housing. Uh, I'm the only renter on the council, um, and that was what drove me into this primarily, um, because being a renter in Amherst is very difficult. Uh, you know, our housing market, uh, it's difficult to find available, affordable, and adequate housing. Um, and so my hope is, among the many issues that I expect the council to tackle, uh, is that housing will be one of them, housing production and affordability. And is that only for millennials? No, and in fact, I think that impacts millennials quite a bit, and that's a big chunk of our renter population. Uh, but we also have young families who are looking to move here who aren't quite ready for a starter home. Um, and certainly as we become an increasingly uh, retirement destination, uh, we have seniors who are looking to downsize seniors who, who don't want to take on the responsibility of a house. Um, and the lack of a rental stock it hurts them as well. So it, it's really, it's, uh, it's, a, it's not confined to one generation, um, even if my experience is within my generation. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm assuming that you've uh, checked out the town's existing master plan mm -hmm. with regard to what it says ab about housing. Um, what's that look like to you? Right, so you know, the master plan said we're going to conserve these areas and we're going to develop these areas. And we've done a great job of conserving the areas that we said. Uh, I don't think we've done as good a job of, uh, in, in production of housing in the areas in the village centers that we said we would focus on. Uh, we're starting to see some projects uh, come up, but we're not quite there, where I think uh, our demand is still far outstripping our supply. And I think that uh, a big focus is going to be on how do, we, how do we boost that supply so that we have uh, a better balance between supply and demand. So speaking of master planning, how does the master plan, uh, the town's existing master plan, look to you to the extent that you're familiar with it? And where do you think we need to go? Isn't that one of the uh, responsibilities and functions of the town council to ensure that we have good planning in town? How is that going to get done in the future as compared to our historic uh, approaches to planning in town? So one of the unique things about the charter that, that was passed and caused the town council to be formed is that the town council has almost equal responsibility with the planning board of being keepers of the master plan. So by mass general... Keepers of the master plan, um, developers of the master plan, whose job but is it? Basically the town council has to um, approve it, but the assumption is that the town council will also have a role in developing, in, in developing and updating it. Okay. So we're not ready for a completely new master plan. The last one was approved 10 years ago. Okay. But by mass general law, it's the planning board's responsibility to basically create the master plan and go through the, the public hearing process. And ultimately, it's their vote which puts it into law. But by our charter, and I, I don't know how unique this is in Massachusetts, the town council also has to, I think the word is endorse. So it's a very much in the interest of all of the the town councillors, and we are having some discussions as to whether or not we'll have our own, you know, master plan update committee or something, mm -hmm. something like that. But I, I think the master plan is incredibly comprehensive. It took a very long time to get to what was approved 10 years ago. It has been, parts of it have been um, added to and e explained better through in the ensuing 10 years. But I think that maybe one of the issues is that it's too general in some ways. So if you read parts of the master plan, you can read many different things into it. And that it becomes then contentious when there are issues of zoning bylaws or what do we mean by housing production? What do we mean by open space? So I would love to see a master plan that became more specific. So I think that the general bones of what we have done are great. I do think a lot of it needs to be updated because of the urgency of climate change and you know issues like that. Mm -hmm. And I also think that we can be more specific in some parts. Typically, how long should a master plan uh, last and, and be viewed as being relatively current, if not immediately current? You, you know, I think that the typical master plan probably has a 25-year shelf life. And I, I, I might be off a little bit on that, but 25 years is about right. So but it should be updated. If it's about 10 years old, um, so what does then the next iteration, if you're not going to do a new one completely for 25 years, what does review and revise activity look like given that we've still got another 15 years to go on that one? Uh, so to be discussed, so this, this you know, the town council is, is, we're trying to find our wings right now. I know that this is an important issue 
if you read, you read I've all. Been hearing a lot about wings, airplane, <laughs> yeah, <I know>. exactly. <laughs> flying while you're building the airplane. But yeah. Okay, yeah. you guys are you're yeah. you're armed with the wings. So this is. Yeah, and I think that uh, if you read the if you read the campaign literature of everyone who made it onto the council, I think we all mentioned the master plan in one way or another. So I think mm -hmm. that there is a desire to to uh, update it, to understand it better, to, but whether or not we're ready to start that process of completely doing a new one. The master plan has to be directly linked to the zoning bylaw, and that's been the case forever, mm -hmm. but it's not clear to everyone that there is that connection. So there's also discussion about updating the zoning bylaw. So I think that mm -hmm. the master plan and the zoning bylaw, that can happen in as a parallel effort. And you're hoping to be one of the leaders of that effort on the council, even though everybody wants to be part of it. And I've noticed from watching the meetings, you're also engaged in every subject. It feels like you all want to be on every committee. We all want to be, we want every. <laughs> and you all want to be a committee of the whole on every subject, which of course is not practical, but yeah. it's great that that means everybody does want to engage. But you have to be able to trust that a group of five or so members are going to do quality work that will help the council have a, a, a constructive conversation on it because we don't want to repeat this idea that uh, we've heard so much about in the past that uh, committees do a lot of work and then it doesn't get added to by other people it gets destroyed by other people so so far the I think the process has been very effective so whether or not all the committees need to be five people and we need to have what the, the right number of committees is that needs to be we need to have a shakeout on mm -hmm. that but so right now I'm on the committee of uh, governance operations and legislation with with Evan Evans the vice chair vice of that. chair right and the climate change committee is our first action that we're sort of working our way through and I think the conversations have been great, you know, in terms of taking a piece of legislation that was really authored by two counselors, bringing that to a group of, expanding that to a group of five who have input into that, and then eventually to the group of 13. To me, that has been a very effective process. But whether or not we need five people to do that, whether it could be a smaller group, say three. So sometimes three, sometimes five, yeah. maybe sometimes yeah. seven. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> you're, reading, you're reading my mind. Maybe. I'm impressed. Okay, you're reading my very mind. Very good. So um, let's focus for a couple of minutes on uh, this committee that you're both on. Mm -hmm. um, governance, organization, and legislation. You got it. Okay. And you're Mr. Vice Chairman. Correct. So what lies ahead? What, what, what's the big challenge before that committee? So I think the big challenge before that committee is the committee figuring out what that committee's role is. Uh, Don't you think every committee's got that problem? Of course. <laughs> um, but I think, you know, one of the, we've had two meetings now and they've been focused on this uh, climate change committee charge. Um, and so we're doing this thing where we're trying to figure out what our role is and how we make decisions uh, based on this charge. And sometimes it's really useful uh, to figure yourself out by actually doing something. Um, but it also creates some challenges sometimes because you have these questions of are we making this decision just because of this charge or is this something that we're setting a precedent that we're going to apply to all legislation in the future. Um, and so at some point we have to figure out how do we decide policy um, and also how do we make sure that we're restricting our role. Uh, we're, we're charged with making sure that the content and form is consistent, clear, and actionable. So we're not charged with evaluating uh, the substance of any piece of legislation. Uh, but that, that boundary can be very blurry, and a lot of our conversations have been, are we discussing something that's actually substantive right now? Is this a technical change? And sometimes that line isn't clear. And so I think one of the major challenges this committee will face uh, is figuring out where that boundary is and being able to check ourselves and say, we're, we're, we're going outside of our purview right now when we perhaps are treading so into substantive territory. So that responsibility territory. is not to make judgment on the content of the legislation. It's to set up a process that's transparent, clear, that follows a certain um, form and Correct. orderly process so that the petitioner knows what they have to produce, how they produce it, how they submit it, and then how it will be considered. Is that basically it? So it's process 
not content. Right, and it's content in so far as uh, does this does this have all of the content that's needed uh, for this to go forward, um, making sure things aren't missing, um, but also making that making sure that the content. Uh, doesn't perhaps present uh, a logical problem that's inconsistent with the charter um, or perhaps inconsistent with a, a prior decision made by the council. So content's evaluated, but not necessarily for substance or intent. So to make sure that if there's going to be a penalty, f if there's going to be uh, something that will be determined that you have either violated or not violated something in town, Correct. Um, is there a penalty section so we know what the sanction is as opposed to what the sanction is. is I, think that a, I think it's an more example of that? trying to make sure that it doesn't violate anything before it even comes to the council. Um, okay. Because the council has often gotten wrapped up in some of these debates that are fairly technical, um, right. that are time consuming. Anyone who's watched a council meeting knows they've been lengthy. Um, and so part of it is using this committee to hash out problems that we see uh, in legislation before they go to the full council, so the council can work more efficiently. Okay. Steve, do you have some observations about what you're hoping that committee is going to be doing or, and uh, possible reactions to what Evans just said? And we're, you know, we're brand new. We've had exactly one test case. So I think that there probably will be a difference eventually between legislation that's proposed by the councilors themselves versus legislation that's proposed through the petition process by people outside of the council. Okay. So in the case of the latter, the petition um, articles or whatever the proper term is now, I think it's very important not to deal with the substance. So in other words, the, if someone thinks that there should be legislation, that there shall be no kite flying on the common or something like that, I don't think it's the position of the councilors to pass judgment on whether or not that's a good idea, but to help them through this process. I think that when we propose our own legislation, whether it be a group of, you know, a one person or two people, then I think that it becomes kind of a different conversation because it's basically council proposed legislation. And in that case, I think discussion of substance is actually very helpful. So it's in a way, it's better to have that discussion at the committee member as the group of five rather than really if for no other reason for, for saving time, you know, rather than at the group of 13. But we'll work our way, we'll work our way through Anything this. to be said about the governance and organizational uh, aspects of the work of that committee? Um, more routine, more detail-oriented, um, yawn material, um, inside ball game, um, not that critical for the public to be focusing on that more, they should be focusing on the legislation or their components of governance yeah, and you know, organization. We haven't gotten to the, um, specifically to the governance and organization part of that, and that really has to do with the internal, more or less the internal operations mm -hmm. of the council itself, which in turn will give us rules for how, you know, even this committee, you know, can operate. But I, I think in a way the, the, this may be one of the committees where the action happens. So the analogy might be the zoning subcommittee. For, the, for those of you that like inside baseball, it would be the, perhaps the equivalent of the zoning subcommittee of the planning board. Mm -hmm. So it was the zoning subcommittee that w was essentially the, the governance organization and legislation committee of the planning board. But that's where petition articles came to, to, be, you know, to be vetted, and the zoning subcommittee would work with the petitioners not to pass judgment on it, but to, you know, to help make the best possible legislation. Mm -hmm. But it also was the group that, that generated legislation that then, when it seemed to be ready, would then go to the whole planning board you know, for action. And the action was whether or not to advance it to, you know, to town meeting okay. or not. So it's, uh, it's a, uh, a committee where review is done, a decision is made whether it's ready for prime time. And if it's not, then you work with the petitioners, helping them understand how it needs to be improved, not necessarily the detail of it, but what's missing or uh, what could strengthen it as it goes forward so that you're not wasting the time of the council in reviewing it and then sending it back. You, you bring it a, as a better and stronger product to the full council. 
and possibly we we have to work through it and see if that works yeah. that way okay and uh evan you're on another committee communications outreach and appointments correct so um what's up with that <laughs> so that that committee has a, a pretty broad charge everything from uh, trying to engage residents, working with our new community participation officers, um, and also figuring out what our role is in the appointment process. Uh, so the council essentially has uh, appointments that they make themselves uh, to planning board and zoning board of appeals, uh, but we also have a role in confirming uh, the town manager's appointments to committees of the town and also uh, department heads. And so part of what we need to figure out as a committee in, in figuring ourselves out is what, what is that role? Uh, you know, a lot of, I think, how we have, uh, how, how we've thought of how do we operate is based on perhaps how the select board may have operated. But this is a different animal. The select board was an executive body. Um, and so perhaps when it comes to how we handle appointments, uh, what our involvement is in that process, uh, we need to separate ourselves from that and think about what is the role of a legislative body um, in appointments that have to be confirmed by that body but that are, are made by the town manager. Um, and I think part of that is, is, is just as I talked about establishing boundaries in governance, uh, where do those boundaries lie? Uh, mm -hmm. you know, I don't necessarily think we want to be uh, a committee that just rubber stamps every approval that comes to us, um, but we also want to make sure that we're respecting the authority of the town manager and that we're not, as a legislative branch, uh, stepping on the toes of the executive. Mm -hmm. That said, the charter gives you authority and responsibility as a council, and therefore, while they may not have wanted you to be a rubber stamp, they mm -hmm. wanted you to exercise judgment or Correct. they wouldn't have put them before you. Correct. So it's a matter of thinking through and understanding where that line is, is what you're trying to... Uh, right. And, and uh, so how, how do you see the council um, looking at those appointments? What's the, the process and the method? If you're not rubber stamping right. everything and you're not questioning everything, What's the mechanism between, uh, to balance those two? All right, so that's a great question. Um, and uh, that's what we're grappling with. And Work I don't, in progress. I don't have an answer to that. So our, our first meeting, we sort of sat down and said, uh, let's think about how perhaps we can diagram out a, a decision tree for, for mm -hmm. how we deal with appointments. There are five members of that committee and there were five different opinions of what that should look like and... and there uh, weren't seven? <laughs> <laughs> Thank goodness. <laughs> and so, um, you know, to, to a lot of people, uh, a decision tree of how we handle appointments by the town managers is something that is uh, unsexy, right? It's not something that is going to get people um, uh, super engaged, but it's important, and, it, and we're establishing some precedent here, and we're establishing how we function as a committee. We all have different ideas, and so it's going to take some time for us to figure out, uh, one, what our role is, and how we interpret what the Charter says is our authority to, uh, to review and, and confirm. Um, but also what's the process by which we do that. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we have essentially, when it comes to town manager appointments, three three actors. We have the, the town council, uh, we have the town manager, and then we also have the resident advisory board that's there to advise the town manager. Mm -hmm. um, and so understanding what the relationship <coughs> is between those three actors um, and making sure that we have a process that works for everyone mm -hmm. um, that's, that's clean and efficient. And it's going to take a little bit of, of time and probably some trial and error. And so these are several examples when we were talking about the planning and you're talking about the appointments. There are existing historical structures that mm -hmm. are still in place. They haven't been all wiped out, but there have been some new structures added mm -hmm. in addition, or revisions of the relationships and roles between some old structures and some new structures. So this is a reminder that we're very early in the process of getting our town council up and running. And so this uh, idea of trying to um, fly the airplane while you're building it is actually, a, a, it's actually, it's funny, but it's also true and real that there's a lot of work and detail that has to be uh, worked out and, and figured out as in order for this thing to function properly. And so there's a lot of examples of that in today's conversation and others. So we only have a couple of minutes left, so I wanted to get your, your thoughts and reaction because uh, neither of you are on the finance committee, is that correct? 
safeguard. Correct. That's correct. So yeah. uh, one of the most important products that any legislative body produces is their budget because it's a reflection of priorities, values, how you're going to spend, what you're going to invest your limited resources in, and lots of decisions get to be made. There are five people who are going to sit on that finance committee. There's a number of other mechanisms that are out there. Um, how do you see your role? So um, uh, when I say some other things, there's the capital committee, then there's the coordinating right. committee, and the, and the participatory budget commission. So how do you as councils who do not sit on the finance committee, and you're one of only 13, you're not a, a town meeting of 200 plus, mm -hmm. how are you seeing your role in the budgeting process, and what are you hoping for, given that you're not on the committee? And we've got about um, uh, a minute and 30 seconds, <laughs> so you each get to give a quick thought about that. What would you expect as another member of the council? So one characteristic of, of that I brought to town meeting was to follow and trust the processes that came before town meeting. So finance, we, we've always, you know, town meeting had a finance committee and that met diligently working with the town manager and with the other, you know, relevant departments to craft a budget to bring to town meeting. So I would follow that. They would, uh, the planning board had a role in that process. Okay. Uh, um, but so then having followed that process all the way up to the time that it came to, legis to the legislature, the town meeting, I felt very comfortable on, you know, voting a particular way on the budget. Because you had been following the detail of it yep. enough and you felt you had enough input even up to that point. Yep. Evan. Right. So uh, it was stated earlier that one of the things this council is going to have to do is, is build that faith and trust in its committee system um, so that we're not creating a committee of 13 for every issue. Um, and so I think that we, that my role as someone who's not on the finance committee uh, is to have that faith that the finance committee is doing their due diligence and, and taking a very deliberative approach. Um, it's also my role as a counselor, however, and a district counselor especially, uh, to be there to advocate for the priorities that, that, that I want to see in the budget, both to the council and also to the town manager. So you'd hope to have input along the process as well from, with the town manager, Correct. with the finance committee and then have your uh, voice at the table as it comes time to do the final vote. Correct, but, but also making sure that we but have also faith in our committees. But also respecting the committee Correct. and the hard work they will have done. Well, that's it for tonight. Thank you so much for joining us, and Evan and Steve, a great first conversation, and thank continue you, the great work on the council. And thank you so much. Thank you.